It might be in your mind as to why this building is erected. This question will be answered to your satisfaction this afternoon. We have with us Mr. Grant Souter, who is the secretary and treasurer of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, Brooklyn. He will speak to us on the purpose of the Kingdom Hall. And it gives me great joy to introduce to you Mr. Souter. Mr. Souter. It's a real pleasure to be present with all of you on this occasion. And I am grateful for the welcome that has been extended to all of us from outside of this area by Jehovah's Witnesses here in welcoming us to their dedication exercises. For a long time there has been a congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses in this area known during many years past as the Rosetta Company of Jehovah's Witnesses. The fact of the matter is that this congregation dates back to about 1908 when those who were devoted to God began to study His Word with a view of learning the meaning of present world events, of Bible prophecy, of the principles laid down in the Bible for the guidance of the conduct of Christians, and uniting not in a denomination, but for this purpose, have since then existed as a congregation or company of Jehovah's Witnesses here. As many of you may know, some years ago, they built a small kingdom hall in the little city of Rosetto, but the work has expanded and increased, and more and more persons have been moved by their understanding of the scriptures to associate themselves together for further mutual assistance and service of God, and larger facilities then were needed. And after much work, planning, and united effort, the result is this beautiful Kingdom Hall that we dedicate today. We rejoice very much with the local congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses in this area for the provision which God has made for them. The company here, that is the congregation, states that they today dedicate this hall. And it is my privilege to act as their spokesman in so doing. But really what it means is that before all of you their brothers and before all of you good people of this area who have come to this meeting this afternoon, the local congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses goes on record by telling publicly that to which this hall is dedicated and so everyone may know what to expect from the use of this hall. By thus going on record, this group of Christians enables us to understand what we expect them to do in the days ahead, in their own activity as a congregation and in the use of the provisions which have been made, and particularly in the use of this building, this structure. At once then, we think of this wonderful modern miracle which is going on all over the earth and which makes this Kingdom Hall possible and to which this Kingdom Hall makes a contribution. It is the miracle of the proclamation of Jehovah's Word and the expansion of Jehovah's worship. You know I do not doubt of the somewhat strange activities of Jehovah's Witnesses. We say strange because they're not orthodox, not the same as other religious organizations carry on. For instance, you know Jehovah's Witnesses preach on the streets. 
they do so by advertising their Bible studies on the streets and offering the Watchtower magazine to passers-by, the Awake magazine, and otherwise interesting persons whom they meet on the public thoroughfares in Bible study. They go from house to house, and call people to the doors of their homes and talk to them about the Bible, introducing themselves as ministers as they are, and endeavoring to arouse the householder's interest in the study of the scriptures, and endeavoring to place with them Bible study helps, which the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society prints for Jehovah's Witnesses. They make return visits on people who are interested in Bible study. And going into their homes with one or two or the family every week or at convenient times, an hour or so is spent in concentrated study of the Bible. It's always the Bible. It's always the Scriptures because they recognize this as God's Word. They hold public meetings in their halls, in private homes, out of doors, in parks, and in other places where it is convenient for people to assemble. All this service to the people is supported as far as the cost is concerned by Jehovah's Witnesses themselves. They do not solicit money nor take up collections or in any other way try to get money from the public. This is not done. They have in mind what the Apostle Paul said when he said, I covet no man's gold, and they do not, they pay their way. They support themselves in secular work and they engage in their ministry in conjunction with that. So this is a strange way of carrying on a religion, it seems, sometimes, when we compare it to the more orthodox methods of religious worship. Also, the message which Jehovah's Witnesses preach, the things they say, are strange to some ears. Perhaps we think back over the past 43 years or so since there have been Jehovah's Witnesses in this, in this section, and we say, why, for 43 years they've been telling us to study the Bible for 43 years. They've been telling us that God's kingdom is near. For all this length of time, they've advised the people to place their hopes in the blessings of the kingdom, telling us that the battle of Armageddon is near, that the safety of the people is in an understanding of the scriptures so they may be carried through the battle of Armageddon when Jehovah will eliminate wickedness from the earth and destroy Satan's organization that oppresses man and defames God's name. Well, 43 years is a long time to preach this. It hasn't occurred sometimes, we say. Things go on as they are. So isn't this a rather strange thing to do, to continually preach concerning the kingdom coming, the kingdom blessings, the nearness of Armageddon, and the action that the people should take for their welfare just through the study of the scriptures. Well, it's well to have in mind this, that the information that we so very much wish to bring to the people of all lands and all communities is from the Bible. We want to get the people to read the Bible and study it and get into their own minds and hearts those things that are written in the Bible. There's only one way to do that, and that's through personal Bible study. It's just like trying to learn to be a doctor or a lawyer or any profession or trade. <laughs> we can hear people discuss it. It's a help. But we have to personally apply ourselves to personally study the subject in which we are interested to get it into our own minds and hearts, make it our own, and so it is with the Scriptures. It isn't enough that we hear somebody talk about the Bible or have it in our possession. It is given for man's instruction. And so, that is the reason that Jehovah's Witnesses go to such great lengths to encourage the people to study the Bible. Well, now, as far as the message they bring concerning the kingdom, concerning Armageddon, the kingdom blessings, those words aren't 
knew within the last 43 years or within the last 100 years. Those things were written in God's Word over a period of time dating from 1513 before Christ until now. The so-called Old Testament or Hebrew Scriptures are filled with prophetic statements of God's purpose to establish a righteous government over this earth for his blessings to come to those who will serve him. No one originated that recently. It's in the Bible. We call it the Old Testament. And then after Jesus' day, the New Testament or Greek scriptures were provided containing the teachings of Christ Jesus and his apostles and his disciples. And the two, the Old and New Testament, to the Hebrew and Greek scriptures, as they are more properly termed, constitute all of the Bible. Well, it isn't manufacturing something new, is it? To point to those things which Jehovah God had written by faithful servants in centuries past. To call attention to the fulfillment of their prophecies. And to the righteous principles of conduct for Christians, which this word of God contains. Of course it isn't. In fact, the oldest religion upon the face of this earth is the worship of Jehovah God. And it is to that religion, which is the oldest religion upon earth, that Jehovah's Witnesses adhere now and to which they have always adhered throughout all the centuries of man's history. They're not a denomination. They're not a sect. They're not a cult. They're not following any human leader. But those things that are written in God's Word, the Bible, they believe just as much as we believe we're here this afternoon. We know that in the writings of the Apostle Paul, in the book of Hebrews, he refers to many, many men who lived before Jesus' day, and many women too. He says that they constitute altogether a great crowd, or cloud of witnesses, that have an example for us in their faith and faithfulness, that they look forward to the kingdom of Jehovah God under Christ Jesus, ruling over this earth, that they hope to have life upon earth during the time of that kingdom. Paul points out that they all died not receiving the promise. Yet that promise is sure, and their hope is in the resurrection under the kingdom rule of Christ Jesus. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that just as much as those men and women concerning whom the Apostle Paul wrote. Abel, Enoch, Noah, Noah's family, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, on down through the line of the prophets and the patriarchs of Israel, down through the last of the prophets, John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ Jesus, John the Immerser, and Christ Jesus, the greatest of all prophets himself, the Son of God and the leader of Christianity. See, we believe those things in the Bible. We know they're true, they're God's Word. And our mission upon earth is to help other people get that information. God has put in the Bible for man's instruction. Now since 1908, when the local congregation here was first organized, hundreds and thousands of persons in this section have been served with Bible information. During all these years, this work has been done. But the miracle of it all isn't that it's done here only. The miracle is that it is not confined to this place. But the same things that you see Jehovah's Witnesses doing in this section of the world, those things are being done in every nation upon the earth. You see hundreds here this afternoon, instead of a handful many years ago, most all from this same section. You will see that same phenomenal increase in those who are worshiping Jehovah God in every country under the sun, among black and white and yellow races and red. 
in the Orient, in the Occident, in Europe, in North and South America, all over. Why? Because those things to which Jehovah's Witnesses have long pointed since the days before the flood, those things which Christ Jesus preached when he referred to the kingdom and the signs of his presence in the 24th chapter of his prophecy recorded in Matthew, those things are focusing upon the day in which we are living. So how appropriate it is then that in this day the education of the people in God's word should expand and that the numbers of those who worship God should increase. And we have in mind the fact that a man worships God individually and not through another man or an organization. The blessings of the kingdom promised in the Bible are manifold. There's so many. That is the blessings of the reign of Christ Jesus over this earth, the earthly blessings. We read about God giving men health and cure of a regeneration of them to physical perfection eventually, of eliminating ills and suffering caused by economic conditions now, caused by corrupt politics, faithless religion or false religion. The blessings of the kingdom are so numerous, those of peace and prosperity and righteousness, life and liberty, enjoying the blessings of this earth, the things it produces, the food and the raiment and the beautiful things, the luxuries and the necessities of life. And we know that after the battle of Armageddon is fought and God there vindicates his name and proves his sovereignty and his power and establishes the fact that he is Jehovah, we know that after Armageddon these blessed conditions will prevail. But there's more to the kingdom blessings than that, there's more to the kingdom rule of man upon earth than material blessings. They'll all center around the worship of Jehovah God because in the scripture so many times, referring both to the battle of Armageddon and to the righteous reign of Christ Jesus over the earth, he states, they shall know that I am Jehovah. So, it is primarily the worship of Jehovah God that will distinguish this new world and the new earth of God's building, ruling over this very planet which was made to be man's everlasting home. Well then, when would we expect these kingdom conditions to begin? It helps us a little bit if we briefly go over the history of theocratic rule, that is God's rule or God's worship let us say, in the earth. It was carried on in Eden prior to man's rebellion against God and sin. Noah worshipped God. He was devoted to Jehovah, although he was an imperfect man, inheriting imperfections from Adam. After Noah and his family, others came along. Melchizedek is mentioned and others. And then you recall faithful Abraham, who was a servant of God and eventually is called in the scriptures the father of the faithful and a friend of God because he believed God's word. And finally, the nation of Israel was organized and God's law was given to them and they worshiped him. Moses was the mediator and leader of Israel, a servant of God. And so there have been upon earth at all times some who did worship Jehovah, but God has not ruled over all this earth. In fact, the only nation over which Jehovah has been king was the nation of Israel during the period when God used the Israelites, ending with 607 B.C. when Israel was cast off and overthrown, as pointed out in the Bible and also in secular history. And you may recall from reading ancient history or from reading the Bible how the, the kingdom of Babylon overthrew Jerusalem and it ceased to be a nation from that time forward. Although the Jews have maintained more or less of an identity throughout all these ages. However, we know that David was a king in Israel. We know that there were others who were kings in Israel and it's written concerning them that they sat upon Jehovah's throne. Yet when Israel was cast off because of turning after false religion and not worshiping Jehovah God, 
The scriptures point out that Jehovah ruled over no part of this earth. He had his worship carried on, but he was not king. They also show that the time would come when Christ Jesus would be enthroned as Jehovah's representative to rule over this earth. And if you have familiarized yourself with the information which Jehovah's Witnesses have been carrying to the people for these many years from the Bible, you know that we continually point to the year 1914 as the year marking the end of Gentile domination or the times of the nations, the end of uninterrupted rule of Satan's organization and the beginning of the rule of Christ Jesus. And we say that there are two reasons for pointing to that year. One is chronology points to it the time reckoning in the Bible chronology and secondly the signs of the times which are more important fulfill the prophecies of the Bible pointing to that wonderful year we can talk about that and give the Bible evidence on that this afternoon we don't have time but we want to establish the fact that Jehovah's Witnesses believe from Bible evidence that the kingdom of God under Christ Jesus began in 1914 marked for the beginning of World War I and the other events since that time in fulfillment of Bible prophecy and that therefore this period of time from the beginning of the kingdom until the Battle of Armageddon is a time set aside for the proclamation of the truths concerning God's word in order that many might learn of his requirements, take their stand on his side and receive his blessings. That is the reason why this work is being carried on all over the earth without asking for money without asking for favor Jehovah's Witnesses are endeavoring to preach the gospel of the kingdom as they understand it from the Bible we want you to believe what you read in the Bible because it's there and not because one of Jehovah's Witnesses or somebody else tells you it's true Jehovah's Witnesses have a definite objective in mind in addition to this matter of preaching. Their hope is in that kingdom of God. They hope, most of them, to live right here upon the earth under that kingdom rule. They want to live there. They want life. Now, we know very well that after Armageddon, everybody on earth is going to be worshiping Jehovah God. We already asked the questions where, or rather when, should these kingdom conditions be expected to begin. Should they begin in 1914? If the kingdom began to operate then because Christ is the heavenly invisible king and his rule is only made manifest by the work that he conducts upon the earth by God's authorization. Well, we know that men are relieved from political ills. The corrupt politicians are still running politics, still robbing the people right and left the people are paying the bills there's been no change there economic conditions continue to make the people suffer there are still famines there are still death and disease with men we haven't seen the kingdom conditions ushered in as far as material things are concerned they'll come through a gradual natural process after Armageddon but they are not the most important things are they they depend upon something more important. They depend upon the creatures in the new earth, worshiping Jehovah God, the source of all of our blessings. We would expect that the most important thing would come to pass upon the earth that would be started after the beginning of Christ's reign, after 1914, even before the Battle of Armageddon, because of the reason for people being carried through this time of trouble into God's kingdom without going down into death is that they might worship Jehovah after Armageddon. The only reason they would be carried through that time of trouble is because they worship Jehovah God now. And that's the reason that the worship of Jehovah God is increasing throughout the earth. It's not a religious, denominational, sectarian matter. It means that people by the hundreds and hundreds of thousands are for the first time in their lives centering their attention on God's word, the Bible. Jehovah's Witnesses do not deserve credit for this. 
They disclaim credit. All the credit is due to Jehovah God through Christ Jesus because he gave us the Bible in the first place. And it's his word that is the inducing cause for the ministry of Jehovah's Witnesses. So it is to this kingdom condition, the great sign upon earth that God's kingdom has come, the worship of Jehovah, to his word and his name and his honor, that this kingdom hall by Jehovah's Witnesses is dedicated. The building itself is not most important. There are many buildings upon earth more beautiful, not more dear to us, but it's not important. Solomon, one of Israel's kings, built a temple to Jehovah, and he had a dedication ceremony too. It was a little different than ours, I guess. It was a long time ago, but it's recorded in the Bible in the 8th chapter of 1 Kings. And it was a glorious temple built according to Jehovah's direction. That is the plans he made. This wasn't built according to heavenly plans. This building was built according to plans of men that know about building buildings. And it's well designed and well thought out structure, and it is. It's beautiful. But Solomon's temple was more grand and glorious. But this is what Solomon said on that dedication occasion. We read in 1 Kings, the 8th chapter, Solomon stood before the altar of Jehovah in the presence of all the assembly of Israel, spread forth his hand toward heaven, and he said, O Jehovah, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath who keeps covenant and loving kindness with your servants that walk before you with all their heart. But will God in very deed dwell on the earth? Behold, Heaven and the heavens of heavens cannot contain you, how much less this house that I have built. Solomon had the right idea. He knew that Jehovah God wasn't going to come down and live in a building built with men's hands. No building is a church as far as that word is used in the Bible. God's servants collectively are the church or congregation, not a structure not a building. No, the thing that makes this building important is its relationship to Jehovah's worship. Where is Solomon's temple today? It's destroyed long ago. When God's worship was taken out of that building, it wasn't any good, just like any other buildings. That's the way with this building, too. Without Jehovah's worship carried on here, it would be just as empty a shell as other religious structures throughout the world are empty shells. The Watchtower Society is an expression of its estimation of a kingdom hall where it, when it says in a little booklet called Council on Theocratic Organization, the kingdom hall is truly the most important structure in the community since its purpose relates to the kingdom work. That's the reason it's important. It's a place of assembly for worship. And so the society says further, the place for assembly for worship of Jehovah's Witnesses is the kingdom hall. So it's a vital piece of equipment, that's all. There isn't anything holy about this building. Sanctimonious are different. No, there's no words that I might say that would make this building holy nor any other man, no, no ceremony we could perform. Its importance is in relationship to its being the center of kingdom activity in this area, the center of Jehovah's worship. Well, we make those remarks to show you how we feel about the kingdom hall here. And you're entitled to an answer to the question now, well, how will this kingdom hall be used? Well, we look at a few Bible texts on the matter. First of all, 
you can appreciate that we do believe the Bible, and in the scriptures, God's word, we read about the operation of his power and the operation of his word and the operation of love for God upon people. And we find that the result of this operation of God's word, the understanding of it, and love for God, the result of that, or one result, is congregations or groups of Christians getting together. There's no question about that. There's so many texts we might refer to, but one will be sufficient because I believe we recognize that as being true. For instance, Philippians 1, verse 1, Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ, to all the holy ones in union with Christ Jesus, who are in Philippi, along with overseers and ministerial servants. What was Paul addressing here? He was addressing a group in a town called Philippi, just like we might say, uh, oh, we might say Rosetta or Bangor, Penargel, a, a community, a town, a city in this case, addressing this group in union in the study of God's word in his service. And Paul says that he and his associate, uh, Timothy, were slaves of Christ Jesus. And they were writing this letter to these Christians in Philippi. And so we have in the Bible, in the Hebrew, uh, Greek scriptures, the uh, book called the Philippians. That's Paul's epistle to the Philippians. That's this one that he starts out with these words. Well, here he shows that they're in union with Christ Jesus. They're identified as the church or congregation in Philippi. And what's there? Well, there are overseers and ministerial servants. Now, this word overseers and also ministerial servants are English words, of course, and they translate Greek words, and these Greek words mean overseers and ministerial servants. Sometimes these words are translated differently. Sometimes they're called bishops. Uh, and Episcopal or Episcopate is referred to often. They're similar words. They have obtained a religious meaning through their use throughout the years. But in going back to the Greek from which uh, our English Bible here is taken, translated, they have the meaning of servants and overseers and kind of directors having oversight of the work that's being done by the congregation for the sake of organizational unity. But nowhere in all the early Christian setup is there a matter of clergy and laity. There wasn't any of that in the early church. That didn't develop till over 300 years thereafter, nearly 300 years thereafter, after Jesus' death. No, clergy and laity uh, division isn't according to the Christian organization. But as Paul outlines it here, is the proper way for it to exist. A union of people, a congregation, drawn together because of their understanding of the scriptures, their desire to serve God, their consecration to Him. They want to work systematically. Some are more mature in Bible study than others. They assist others in various ways, organizational ways, because when there's a group of people doing the same thing, it requires an organization. Well, this organization among the people upon the earth. That's not uh, the important thing. The important thing is that those individuals are devoted to God and they worship Him. This isn't the denominational matter that the Apostle Paul is talking about. We've got 256 Christian denominations in this country alone. Paul wasn't discussing that. He's talking about this group and how they're organized. So, in this kingdom hall, in this congregation, there's a group who worship God, believe the Bible, and study it. And there are certain ones, certain men in the congregations, who serve as overseers and assistants, ministerial assistants. Who do they assist? Everybody. Are they clergy? Not in distinction to the laity, because all of Jehovah's Witnesses are ministers. They are a society of ministers. It is very difficult for men of the world to understand at the day of the early church how it was that in the early church, among the Christians, there were men who had all kinds of professions to earn their living. But it was true. And Christ Jesus was a carpenter. 
and others were fishermen, doctors, lawyers, tax collectors, men of various professions. Well, where did their ministry come in? It came in after their devotion to do God's will. Individual consecration, you see, and they're joining together with others like con uh, who made a like consecration for this same purpose of worshiping God. Well, then we can see if this is correct that a Christian congregation must preach. And so it is that all of the Rosetta congregation here must preach if they're part of the ministerial congregation. That doesn't mean that if you come to this kingdom hall, you have to engage in preaching. It doesn't mean that at all. This kingdom hall is for the use of everyone, regardless of who he or she is. We're welcome here for their use in Bible study and assistance in any way along those lines. So feel welcome. But in the case of those in Philippi, Paul was addressing a group of Christians organized for the ministry. Now, the society, the Watchtower Society, makes this comment regarding a congregation. It says, the company organization consists of a group of Jehovah's Witnesses in a certain locality who meet regularly for worship and Bible study and unitedly preach the gospel in the field. A company is enrolled, given its territory assignment, provided with literature and equipment for service. The company's organization serves as an organization of true worship in the community, providing a place of assembly for persons of goodwill who desire to learn of and serve the true God, and that's exactly what Jesus said. In the 24th chapter of Matthew, the 14th verse, he said, Speaking of this day when the signs are before our eyes, the signs of his presence, this good news of the kingdom will be preached in all the inhabited earth for the purpose of a witness to all the nations, and then the accomplished end will come. And then in Luke he also said to those who were with him at that time, you are witnesses of these things that I have done. The word witnesses is always applied to Christians throughout the Bible. And it's applied to those who served God before Jesus' day who are not Christians because they lived before Jesus' time. And so in the fourth chapter of Acts we read, Also with great power, the apostles continued giving forth the witness concerning the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and undeserved kindness in large measure was upon them all. So this is a ministerial organization and that's the reason that one of the meetings which will be conducted here in this Kingdom Hall is the service meeting every Thursday at 7.30. A meeting for the discussion and study of the actual ministry itself. Jehovah's Witnesses attend those meetings. Everyone is invited to attend. It will be of interest to you, know, of value. That's one of the purposes of the hall, one of the ways in which the hall will be used in carrying out its main purpose. Jehovah's Witnesses must minister. Now, I know that it sometimes is difficult to conceive of anybody whom you've known for 40 years to be a baker or brick mason or carpenter being a minister. It's kind of like the case of Jesus himself. He was a carpenter for 30 years, or at least until the age of 30. And then he entered his ministry. But he made his living by good, honest, hard work. He didn't have somebody support him because he wanted a soft place in some religious organization. He worked for his living as a carpenter. His, his daddy was a carpenter, and so was Christ Jesus. By his father, I refer to his earthly uh, father, the, uh, the husband of his mother Mary, Joseph. He was a carpenter. And he was referred to as the son of the carpenter Joseph. His real father was Jehovah God in heaven. But the point is, he followed the carpenter uh, profession. Well, long before Jesus' time, from the nation of Israel, a prophet was raised up by the name of Elijah. And he performed certain miracles, but he didn't perform them in his hometown. He went way off to a foreign city and performed some mir a miracle. And so it was in the case of other prophets of old. They performed certain miracles by God's power, 
in order to establish their identity, to prove themselves God's prophets, just the same as in the early church. There used to be in those days miraculous works by Christ Jesus and the early Christians to establish the church as being of God because it was something brand new. That necessity's past now. We have God's word and the words of Christ. But here is the account I wish to draw your attention to. It's in the fourth chapter of Luke. Jesus was preaching, and the account says, They all began to give favorable, favorable witness about him, and to marvel at the winsome words proceeding out of his mouth. And they were saying, This is the son of Joseph, is it not? He was back in his old hometown. He traveled all through the so-called Holy Land, the land of Palestine, and preached. Here he was at home. The account says, so you read it, it's in the fourth chapter of Luke. So they said this. At this Jesus said to them, No doubt you will apply this, this illustration to me. Physician, cure yourself. The things we heard as having happened in Capernaum to also here in your native territory. Jesus said, you'll probably say that about me. Now you do miracles here like you did somewhere else. But he said, certainly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his native territory. For instance, I tell you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months so that a great famine fell upon all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of those women, but only to Zarephath, in the land of Zidon, outside of Israel, to a widow. Also, there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet. Yet none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman, the man of Syria, was cleansed. That's what Jesus said. In other words, he's saying, I'm not going to do here in my hometown the miracles I've done outside. You know me. You know the principles I've followed. You know I'm a good citizen. You know I'm honest. I don't lie. I don't steal. I don't kill. I don't murder. You know I've kept the Jewish law. You've known me for 30 years till I entered this ministry. And yet... If you expect me to perform miracles of healing people who are sick and raising the dead, opening blind eyes and making wine out of water and doing these other things, here where you know me, you're expecting something I'm not going to do. You have my whole life, my course of conduct. Elijah didn't perform his miracles in his hometown and Elijah Elisha didn't either, and neither will I, said Christ Jesus. Now there were two kinds of reactions to that. That which we have already read, they all began to give favorable witness about him and to marvel at the winsome words proceeding out of his mouth. And perhaps they said, that's a wonderful thing. This man who we thought would be a carpenter all his life becomes a preacher of the word of God. And in other cases, people marvel at his words because he spoke as one having authority, because he spoke the truths in God's word, and not some religious hocus-pocus that's contrary to the scriptures. They recognized that, and he was in contrast to the scribes and the Pharisees, who were the false religionists of his day. All right, then there was another reaction on the part of his people in his own hometown, and we read that in the following now all those hearing these things in the synagogue became filled with anger. And they rose up and hurried him outside his home city. And they led him to the brow of the mountain upon which their city had been built in order to throw him down headlong. But he went through the midst of them and continued on his way. He passed on and departed because his time hadn't come. So we must look at the matter, my friends, on this basis. We have one dependable guide in our lives. What might that be? An organization of men? Political? It couldn't be. Ever since the days of the first dictator Nimrod, <clears throat> men have been following one political scheme after another, 
They're no different now than they were then. No. You can't with your whole heart, with assurance and confidence and faith, depend upon a political organization, can you? And say, that's going to bring me everlasting life, peace, the blessings that I long for as a righteous person, a person that loves what's right. Money? Who can depend on money? We'll not have to argue the point that money is not the thing in life we can depend upon. Religion, religious organizations, which one? Sincere and honest people in, in them all. People who love righteousness and love God with different beliefs. So much so that people on the outside often say, oh, the Bible, they all prove it with the Bible. You can prove any old thing with the Bible. Well, let them prove something with the Bible. The people that are so quick to say you can prove any old thing with the Bible never proved anything with the Bible all their lives. They don't use the Bible. They don't know what it has in it. Let them prove something. No, we can't look at a religious organization, Jehovah's Witnesses included, no exception. We can't look at an organization the purpose it's organized and say, that's the sure thing. That's it. There's too much evidence to show it's not certain. It's not sure. Men are imperfect. Men fail. Men have selfishness, and if they're not devoted to God, they may be controlled by selfishness. The devil is the god of this old world, Jesus said, the Apostle Paul, and that's why people do such devilish things that we sometimes say, why do people do such things? It's because Satan, the god of this world and the organizations of men are under his influence. But there is one thing one thing that is sure, absolutely dependable, that's God's word, the Bible. It's true, it's dependable, it's reliable. It's the only thing that men have, the only thing that we can look at and handle and read and understand and grasp, appreciate, the only thing on earth that is absolutely sure and absolutely dependable. Of course, if we don't believe the Bible, we don't believe that. But even things that appear inconsistent in the Bible to a casual reader are understandable and plain and consistent and helpful to a reverent mind. I, I really believe that. There's only one thing. Now that means then that if we want to take a course of action that we feel is going to be right, we can't judge it by worldly standards. We can't look at an organization which always changes its standards according to expediency and to please the most people according to the way the wind's blowing. That's what they believe. If it's wartime, they want war. If it's peacetime, they're for peace. If they're in this country, they're for this country. If they're in that country, they're for that. They're expedient. There's as many standards as there are organizations. There are as many, as many ways of following those as there are individual conveniences. There has to be a guide, something that is a straight edge. That straight edge is the Bible, the things that Jesus taught. So he wasn't going to satisfy people in his own hometown. It wasn't necessary. He taught the truth. He taught the scriptures. They had the Hebrew scriptures just as he had them. The same words were there for them to read as Christ Jesus read and Christ Jesus got them in his heart and they did not. But that's it exactly. So that's the situation. Jehovah God had his word recorded for man's instruction. And into the Bible God has placed his thoughts, his mind. So if we want to know what God thinks about a matter, a problem or a condition, we need to know what the Bible says about that and then we in our minds will have an understanding of God's mind on those matters. So God's spirit or mind or mental attitude 
is expressed in his word, the Bible, how can people understand it if they don't study the Bible? So then, to gain this knowledge and wisdom and understanding of what's in the Bible in this hall, you may expect that if it's used properly, there will be conducted regular Bible studies. And these will be conducted at the Watchtower Study every Sunday evening at 7.30. That's a Bible study. We use the Watchtower Magazine as a help. But we're studying the Bible. Likewise, on this little program slip you received when you came in, there are listed other Bible studies. That's their purpose. Then, then we gain refreshment. We may work hard all day, be encountering some difficulties, or may, may even be somewhat discouraged. When the evening comes, a time for our Bible study. We may say, well, I want to go to bed and get some sleep. And that's quite understandable. But if instead we go to the Bible study, study God's Word with others of His people for an hour or so, we'll come away from that meeting more refreshed, feeling better, with a better outlook on things, a better mental disposition, just from studying the Bible. It works that way. Jesus said, you take my uh, yoke upon you. My yoke is, isn't hard to bear, and learn of me, and I'll give you refreshment. And he gives us refreshment through the study of his word. It gives us spiritual strength, too. Unless there's Bible studies conducted in this kingdom hall, we might as well not have built it in the first place. But Jehovah's Witnesses assure you that there will be such studies here just as long as there's a congregation here in the kingdom hall here to use for that purpose. That's the purpose for which it's built. Of course, the Bible is a big subject. It has lots of information in it. We want to be able to present its information to other persons in our ministry. And we recall that when there are uh, groups of people together, the scriptures show that the one that is taught communicates to the one that teaches. That is to say, if someone's leading the meeting, and it's a study, a group study, they all comment. That's done at the Watchtower study, but it's done in another place. At the Theocratic Ministry School. That's a school of Bible training also held here. And at the present time, there is being held here in the Theocratic Ministry School, which is open to all, and which, like all other meetings, is free, and you're welcome to them, a verse-by-verse -verse study of the New Testament and a comparison of the latest modern translation of the Greek Scriptures, the New World Translation, with other versions, so that the different values of the respective versions can be considered. And a verse-by-verse -verse consideration, verse-by-verse, <laughs> a detailed consideration of the New Testament or the Christian Greek scriptures. Maybe you've never done that before in all your life, but you're invited to. You'll find it so interesting, and in the modern language that we're used to speaking, we can understand Jesus' words and the words of the apostles and the disciples. This is the place to come, then, if you want to learn about what's in the New Testament, which we always refer to as the Christian Greek Scriptures, because the New Testament, as that word is used in the Bible, refers to the New Covenant and not a portion of the Bible. There will be, then, this theocratic ministry school in which men, old and young, lads and elderly men, too, can enroll and take part and learn to give uh, Bible talks if they want to, it's not mandatory, but they have that opportunity. And all take part in following and studying the words of the scriptures. That's what we want the people to study. Also at this place, there will be public meetings conducted. They'll be advertised. People will call at your homes and otherwise advertise these meetings, invite you to them. Because that's one of the time-honored ways of preaching. The fact of the matter is, public meetings, house-to-house -house work, back calls on the people, Bible studies in their homes, and uh, preaching on the streets. They are not the strange ways of preaching. They are the apostolic ways. Because if you're familiar with the history of the Christian church as it's recorded in the Bible, you know that those are the very things Jesus did. 
the very things that the apostles and the disciples of the early church did. It wasn't for 300 years after Jesus' death that they started to have church buildings that they call their own, that is to say, congregational church buildings. Not for 300 years after Jesus' day, Jesus didn't even own a home, didn't even own a bed or a pillow, he said. He had clothes, but he had what savings he may have laid up as a carpenter, and he used them in his ministry, and others with him did secular work along, and they didn't have many needs. People have more needs now because of modern civilization. But the point is, false religion has established the strange ways of worship, not Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses are primitive Christians. They adhere to the same methods of worship that were adhered to by Jehovah's Witnesses ever since there have been men upon this earth. They haven't changed. The only change is that we have more modern things to use now than they had many years ago. This is not in a sectarian manner. You recall that Jesus pointed out to the Samaritan woman at the well that the time would come when men would worship Jehovah God, not in a certain building and in a certain place, but individually, worldwide. In spirit, he says, and in truth. So it shows that the worship of God is an individual matter. On one occasion, when Paul was preaching, along with his companion Barnabas, the people were so enthralled by what they said, they began to worship them. And they tried to make them religious leaders of themselves. We read the account in the 14th chapter of Acts. There is shown a miracle being performed by Paul and Barnabas by the healing of a lame man. Well, these people in this city of Lystra were worshippers of the demons. Zeus. Jupiter, Mercury, and the other gods. You've read about them in Greek mythology, and Roman mythology has counterparts. Well, they're demon gods. They have nothing to do with Christianity, of course. So we read, the crowd, seeing what Paul had done, raised their voices, saying in the Laconian tongue, the gods have become like men and have come down to us. And they went to calling Barnabas Zeus, or Jupiter. Paul they called Hermes or Mercury since he was the one taking the lead in speaking. And the priest of Zeus whose temple was before the city brought bulls and garlands of flowers to the gates and was designed to offer sacrifices of bulls and flowers to Paul and Barnabas along with the crowd. However, when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they took off their outer garments and leaped out into the crowd, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are human creatures having the same infirmities as you do and are declaring the good news to you for you to turn from these vain things to the living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all the things in them. In the past generations, he permitted all the nations to go on in their ways, although indeed he did not leave himself without witness, in that he did good, giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling your heart to the full with food and good cheer. God did that for them, even though they did worship the demons. And yet, by saying these things, they scarcely restrained the crowds from sacrificing to them. They knew that for life we must worship Jehovah God. As Jehovah's Witnesses, if we want life after Armageddon on this new earth, we have to worship Jehovah God now. That's why we want to do so. Because it's Jehovah's work, we feel a responsibility to Him to do so. And because it is His work and He's back of it, there is no power upon earth that can stop it. And it's to that work, by Jehovah's grace, that this Kingdom Hall is dedicated. Read to the sixth chapter of Ephesians where the power of God's word is spoken of and shown to be our safety and protection and our safeguard in these evil days in which we're living. So the study of the Bible is profitable, it's interesting, and for life 
it's absolutely essential because it is God's work. Well, that, in brief, is the great work that is progressing throughout the entire earth. Jehovah's Witnesses have a part in this. In the year 1950, it was carried on in 115 countries by more than 373,000 ministers of Jehovah's Witnesses, serving a congregation of untold millions of persons because the congregation, to use that word to apply to those to whom they preach, are the public, the people upon whom they call and whom they otherwise come in contact. We're very grateful to Jehovah for a privilege of having a part in this. We're very grateful, too, to those in this vicinity who have been so kind to us in the construction of this place. Many businessmen and others have assisted. We do thank them and are glad to do so publicly. They've assisted all the way from helping us obtain materials to, in some instances, uh, instances supplying some flowers for this platform this afternoon. We are grateful for their goodwill. Our main desire in the use of this building is to be a blessing to this community. By bringing to it, or continuing to have in it, a center to which those who so desire can turn for instruction in God's Word, the Bible. And it is to this purpose.